here we go. Welcome everyone to the June Nonprofit Insights and I also produce and host these monthly webinars. These web this webinar opportunity for you to connect with experts and thought leaders in the areas of about big picture issues um, and, and uh, you the free webinars that are dot org. Um, again, we will be sending out links to the full webinar recording and the slides after the session. If you have any questions during the course of the session, there are two ways that you can ask them. The first is using that chat box at the bottom right of the screen, um, and, we, and the second is using Twitter with the hashtag VMLearn. Uh, we'll be monitoring that Twitter conversation throughout the session, and we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, there will be a Q&A period at the end session, but if we don't get to your questions during this hour, hopefully we can do it offline with you. Um, so without further ado, why don't we get started with today's uh, session. Um, we're talking today about the untapped power of volunteer stories. So basically, how can telling the stories of your volunteers help to spread your message and build support for your organization. And we have really amazing speakers here with us to, to talk about that, share their expertise, and provide you with some action that you can use moving forward. First of all, we have um, Tuan Lam from Go Inspire Go. He is a multimedia consultant, a university professor, a thought leader, and a former TV reporter. He dated and is now host of GoInspireGo.com, or GIG as it's called, which is a multimedia platform that uses social networking for social change. His GIG team covers the globe for street corner style heroes, using authentic stories about them while leveraging social media while leveraging social media to create community and raise visibility and support for them and their causes. Billy Wang is the founder, president, and chief executive officer of Baycat, which is a nonprofit right here in San Francisco that educates and empowers young people from historically underserved communities in the digital and media arts, which is a very cool organization. Billy brings an extensive and unique 20-plus year background in education, media, arts, and technology programming, nonprofit business, and law. Her and her passion for digital media arts to capture stories and create social change shapes the building of the Baycat organization. Billy and her organization, Baycat, have received numerous awards and been showcased by organizations and associations across the Bay Area and nationally. And she has also filmed and produced her own short movie entitled Unplugged that was featured in the 2005 Brin Environmental Film Festival. So we are really lucky to have both Tuan and Zilli here with us today to share an expertise with us. And I believe, without further ado, um, we're going to get started with Tuan's presentation. Uh, Tuan, are you ready? Yes. Thank you, Sherry, Zilli, and everyone joining our conversation. Um, excited to hear about your stories as well later. But I'm going to quickly go um, through a little bit about who, uh, who we are, what we're about, what we've done, and where we're going. and then. I'll jump right into um, how to find a good story, how to um, structure a good story, and also um, how to uh, create a story via video. So um, as um, Harry said, uh, my name is Tuan Lam, and I'm the founder of Go Inspire Go. And I've been a reporter for the last years, 
And um, after eight years of reporting the news, I was um, really sick of you know using storytelling and connecting with people to tell stories of death and destruction. So um, you know it had been at me for a while, and I left the business and created Go Fire Go. And at first, I just thought I see how far from, but um, you know. Uh, as and then it was, we're really passionate that we put it out there to the, for the world to see, you know, it resonates. So, again, Go Inspire Go um, is about, um, you know, telling authentic stories every day, uh, street point style heroes, leveraging social media to build community and sparking civic engagement. And um, we're essentially, we're a multimedia platform um, that does that. And at the end of all the videos and blogs, there. Um, action items. Simple, usually three simple things or, uh, or play, things you could do or places that you could go to help the people that um, we featured. Um, so in uh, uncovering these everyday heroes, we hope that you are inspired to uh, you know, find your own power and use it to help others, um, whether it be your time, your money, or your network. Over the last four years, um, about four years old, um, I've been able to, through telling the story of gang, um, been able to, um, you know, harness the power of 40 to 60 volunteers from around the world, and we've done about a story or two a year or two a month, uh, and you know, it's really over $500,000 worth of work, all volunteers so far. Um, and um, a few months into creating Go Inspire Go, uh, the Huffington Post and um, you know, uh, Ariana Huffington Post saw. Um, her story online somewhere, and she emailed me and asked to uh, share her content. So I've become a very follower to share my content about having good and impact pages on those verticals, as well as uh, Deepak Chopra's, um, him and his daughter have an inspiring site called intent.com, and I share. I'm going to move on to slide number three here. Um, one of the stories that really exemplifies uh, what Jake is about is uh, the story of five-year-old Phoebe Russell. She was then five years old, and that this is slide number three. And um, you know, I've come a lot of I've come across of amazing teachers in my life. Phoebe is in fact one of the best teachers. She taught me a lot about um, you know not getting five of that. Uh, and so when I met Phoebe, she was in kindergarten, and Phoebe would walk you know you know parents walk her to school, and she would be hungry and close to people. And she didn't know they were hungry and homeless. She just thought it really made her sad. And so uh, Phoebe thought, um, you know, Phoebe asked her parents, well, why do they look so dirty and makes me really sad? So she knew inherently two things, is that, you know, seeing these sad people made her sad, and number one, and number two, that she really wanted to do something about it. So her parents explained this to her, and she didn't understand why um, hunger existed because, you know, she would go to the store with her parents um, and she had a lot of food in her pantry. And so she told, um, you know, to her teacher, uh, kindergarten teacher, she said, this is Albert, um, who helps help homeless people? I want to help them. And her teacher said, who they help them? Why? And so she said that what she wanted to do, she just picked a number, $1,000 sounded good to her. And she said, I want to raise $1,000 for the food bank. And she had two months to do it before she got promoted uh, to the first grade. And her and parents said, oh, you know, that's really not realistic. That's a lot of money. And she was adamant. So the teacher said, OK, let's write letters. And so they wrote about 50 letters, sent it out to um, different um, family and friends and people in the immediate network. And a few kids trickled in, then several and thousands came in, and then people started putting money anonymously in the envelope and sticking it under her uh, school door. And uh, companies started matching the personal checks and writing in the city. And uh, in two months' time, CB raised about thirty-seven $3,700, $3,700, a little more than that. And that equals 18000 know locally through the food bank here in San Francisco. Um, and so this is where Go Inspire Go we came in and she had a really cute cup balloon party that we attended and we shot a quick video of it. Um, the link share will email to you after this uh, webinar for you to see if you're interested. Um, 
And so we did a video, and at the end of the video, um, you know, it showed Phoebe's uh, cupcake party, and she was giving all the money in the check to um, the executive director of the food bank. I wanted to also mention that uh, she wrote letters to ask for money for aluminum cans because her only ROI, or uh, not ROI, uh, and um, business acumen was, you know, she would put can she would go to the grocery store. the can in the over thirty seven hundred dollars gave it to the executive director of the food bank um, which entail inspired again eight thousand meals um, so we did video the video went live um, and it quickly amassed over thirty one thousand hits um, on slide number three if you look right there at the bottom right hand screen there's a snapshot of how many hits there were and we'll go down to slide four here um, so it heard it viral. Um, people um, in a few months, I got an email from the food bank, um, and they said, "Oh my God, I want to thank you. You have helped us inspire the community through your video um, to uh, up the hundred dollars to twenty thousand two hundred and two dollars, which now went from eighteen thousand meals to thousand meals. Eighty thousand meals served here locally um, in the Francisco area." And then the story gets better through social media. Somebody contacted me and said, "Hey, Tyson Chicken Company um, told me about uh, you know uh, they have some sort of uh, feed the hungry contest." And so he said, "Hey, why don't you check that TV video?" I did that, and chicken executives called me and said um, that they were so inspired by TV story and that they wanted to donate 15 tons of food food bank. Um, Tons of chicken, which equals to 35,000 pounds of chicken. So now we're, I would say, around 150 ish pounds, um, according to San Francisco Food Bank. Um, this was all said by a little just wanted to do something, you know. Um, then, then something amazing happened. Uh, TV was all grown up. Uh, actual video, we, uh, you know, got a shot of a big wave truck coming into the San Francisco Food Bank and um, you know, then delivering all these uh, you know, boxes of chicken. Um, the third story we did, TV was already in first grade. I always say she's grown up at this point. Um, and uh, some people, um, had some kids at her former uh, class saw the video and they replicated her um, aluminum can letter writing campaign. And um, they raised over $3,500. Um, and so, you know, if you fast forward now, I believe TV is second grade, and um, in total, there have been 200,000 plus meals served locally here in the San Francisco area, all by TV. A little hey, that she's one of my um, one because you know, as adults, so many barriers. It's like we we can't do certain things, and you know, um, sometimes it's all about trying and and um, you know, just being passionate about something. And telling your story, so um, so many stories, Phoebe's, that we've been able to do. And again, I thought if five people help five others, that would be awesome. Then a few hundred thousand people started looking. So many people started helping others, and we're starting to collect all the impact on the impact link on our site. Um, so with that said, um, you know stories are so important. Um, since the beginning of time, storytelling has been a part of whole culture from since. Uh, cave men and I say cave women pounded on their chest. Not so much for women <laughs> um, uh, to tell stories or Egyptian etched hieroglyphs, um, hey, you know, Claude. into the pyramid. Claude, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt. There's been some requests for you to talk a little slower. I think your deep voice is a little hard for people to, to hear. So, so maybe sure, sure. more enough so people can follow the amazing stories. Sure. Sorry about that. I get a little bit excited, so let me slow down a little bit. I thought this was my slow tone. Okay, so why are stories important? Since the beginning of time, stories have been a part of every culture. And when cavemen and women have it on their chest, then the Egyptians etched hieroglyphs into the pyramids. It essentially connects us all. In this day and age, video has become essential in getting every message out there. Um, and an interesting tidbit, according to the U.S. Fifth Labor, people retain only 10 percent of what they hear in presentations. Percent. 
we retained 35% from seen, and 65% is retained from people if you combine visual and oral, or in a video. video. Um, so that's amazing. There's a power in story, especially in video now. That's why video, I believe, has become telling a business or organization story. So why should you tell your story? We're here on slide five now. Um, there are three main reasons. One is visibility. That's why we exist, your organization, my organization. Um, and that's why all of the organizations to tell the stuff there, uh, to inform the world, to educate them, turn them to action. Uh, so that's to raise visibility. Second thing is uh, why you should tell your story is volunteers. Uh, to try to um, get volunteers uh, excited about the work that they are doing or to attract volunteers. And through my work at Go Inspire Go, one thing I've realized is that there are so many people wanting to do something, they just don't know how. Um, so if you tell a good story, that will get them excited about being a part of your movement or joining forces with you. So our tagline is discover and use your power to help others. Because I inherently believe that everybody has the power to um, do something to impact others. And it could be as simple as volunteering or smiling at somebody or you know, doing kind, something kind for somebody and being thoughtful. Um, and um, there are a lot of everyday heroes out there, so that's why they're able to capture them and then inspire people to help. Um, so in telling your story, you would also not only be volunteers, but you would keep them um, you know, interested and excited. And also, the third thing is uh, obviously funding. Um, you get people out there and not only going to dedicate their time, they'll also put them where their maps are um, and connect it emotionally um, and would want to help you financially if you know you have some sort of Indiegogo or Kickstarter campaign or something that needs funding. Um, so that's why storytelling is uh, super important. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, the slide six, how to find the story. This is the most difficult part, and being a reporter, I realize that you know a lot of research has to go into you know, what types of stuff to do and how you can find a story. Um, and what I realized is, sure, with the Internet, and we can all go and you know, Google our heart uh, so our heart fire, but really, um, you know, it's right under your nose. Um, the best story that we found is not through the Huffington Post or through other, you know, newspapers and whatnot, but through the people in the community and the people that uh, you are serving and the people that are um, serving your organization. So um, a couple quick tips uh, is dig around your organization. Um, you know, a couple ways to do this is to um, use social media, obviously. It sounds so simple, but um, a lot of organizations don't understand the power of Twitter and its 140 characters, or Facebook, um, to crowdsource different ideas. Um, Instagram is also becoming very popular, um, and so is Pinterest. So it really depends on the type of organization that you have. Um, and a way to, um, to you do that is, of course, people are like, OK, well, how do I utilize Facebook and Twitter and whatnot and social media? Um, there are a couple crowd, um, you know, a couple, um, you know, polls that you could use online to crowdsource these stories, um, and you know, the link. If you just Google Survey Monkey, Survey Monkey, or Doodle, D O O D L E, um, you can create polls that way and just, up, you know, create the questions and answers. That's uh, our questions, and then you upload that as a link. People can click on the link and answer those questions and you can distribute them through your um, uh, online newsletter as well. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on to, um, now that you you know, know a little bit about digging for stories, how to tell a good story. Let's talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, how to structure a story. Of course, we're all you know, stretched for time. Um, we have a lot of projects, um, and of course, fundraising to do. But before you even fundraise, I think you really got to figure out um, how to tell the story of your fundraising um, effort, for example. Um, so the three basic um, ways to structure a, any type of story, especially a video story, I'm going to go through this and give you a, a couple of uh, concrete examples, is 
obviously, you know, it bears repeating again and again because when I look at it, I teach at two universities here in San Francisco. Um, it may sound simple that every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, but so many people forget this. They start off right in the middle and then have an end, or they start off in the beginning and middle and they have no ask or no end. So the beginning, what you want to do with video is you definitely want to hook up. I always tell my students that um, you know you want to put the best audio. It could be a sound bite. It could be some drums um, if you're at some sort of event that has drums. Um, but the best audio or the best video and best info, something that grabs you or wows you right at the top. And for those of you guys that have some sort of journalism background, it's almost the idea of the inverted pyramid where the most important information goes at the top and then the least important information goes in the middle and bottom. So, um, you know, you have five to ten seconds to capture your audience's attention and to do this. The web is cluttered with so many videos, but you want yours to stand out. So if you can kind of hook them in the beginning, chances are they'll get to the middle. And in the middle, I always like to use um, the Pointer Institute, P-O-Y-N-T-E-R, P-O-Y-N-T-E-R Institute, the journalism organization that helps journalists tell stories. They have this, uh, they coined this term called golden nuggets, and golden nuggets could be by way of a great sound bite, or a great nugget of a natural sound, like drums, or, you know, beating, or like, you know, door slamming to get your attention. Um, or it could be your best video, something that's visually really beautiful to open up your, um, you know, open up or to the, the beginning of your piece or to, you know, capture their attention again in the middle of the piece to get people engaged. Um, you always want to remember when you're doing video, if it elicits like a wow or it tugs at your heartstrings or you're like, you, you think, aw, or something like that, if it evokes some sort of emotion, it'll allow your audience um, to feel the same way as well. And, um, you know, I, one thing I like to, um, I heard that, that other people do and I like to do too is when I watch a story, team raise their hands every time it evokes some sort of emotion because you know that that is a good story that evokes emotion. Because it evokes emotion equals action. And then you reach your end. You want to ask them at the end of the video, you want to ask, well, what now or what next? Um, you know, what is your moral of the story? Uh, what are you asking them to do? Uh, with Phoebe's story, let's go back to that. At the end of the video, there was um, text that said, if a five-year-old girl can inspire nearly 18,000 meals, what can you do? And then we have the three things that you could do. Donate to the San Francisco Food Bank, and then here's the link. You can volunteer with the San Francisco Food Bank. Or the third thing is, you know, donate or volunteer at your local food bank. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the ending is very important because you have to, um, now that you got, you told a good story, you got their attention, you want to say, okay, well now here's the time to take action. And I think that's the thing that makes Go Inspire Go different than other inspiring sites, is that you get excited, but right away you want to capture them and say, okay, well this is what you can do with X amount of dollars or with X amount of manpower or woman, woman power, you could do this, that, and the other. You know, okay. So I'm going to move on to um, slide eight: telling a good story and the elements. So when you go out to a story uh, and you don't have a lot of experience, you know, telling a story, these are the elements that you have to have so that the viewers do, don't walk away confused. Um, and I call it the five W's and the how. Okay, and I'll start off with um, the who. Who is this? Who? You know, who is this about? Um, what? What is this about? Where is this happening? Is it happening locally in your community? Is it happening in Peru or Africa or Canada? Um, do you have your who, your what? And then when is it happening and where? And then the most important is why? Why, why is this person video should have to make it interesting and to make it you, to set yourself aside from the other videos that clutter the internet, you have to ask yourself, why is this story unique? Why should the people care? Why should you care? And why should you help? You also want to include, so you have the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. Now you also need the how. How can you help? How can you get involved? 
And those are the uh, key elements. If you're missing one of those elements after, the, after you watch the video, generally you will confuse the audience. And let me tell you, the audience is, we're all um, lazy viewers on the internet because there's so many things out there. You have to keep it super simple for people to understand. Um, I'm going to move to my last slide here and I'll go through some tips on how to now produce a good video, uh, at least collecting the elements for a good video. And what I also say too, if, if this sounds very overwhelming, um, it, it's okay because the practice makes perfect and also uh, I may be good at videos and telling stories, but I may not be good at, the, for example, spreadsheet or, for example, maybe editing. So this is, if you tell a good story, just even verbally, it's by word of mouth or through your newsletter, the people who know and understand this world and can help you as well. But things that you should also keep in mind as um, you know, executive director or volunteer or uh, somebody helping on a nonprofit is the first thing I always say is keep it simple. It is one thing that I hear all the time with kids. We always think that we have to tell a complex story to get results, and it's really not true. The simpler, the better. And that's the magic of um, TV, is that you, sometimes it's a really complex story, and they break it down to a minute 15 or two minute story, and it captures your audience to get you, know, get you excited and find out more information. So try to keep it as simple as possible, beginning, middle, and who, what, where, or why, how. Make sure those elements are there, at least. The second thing is lighting is critical. Uh, the way it works, both digital and um, 35 meter, is that it captures light and records it. That's all the camera. So the, the, if light is behind a subject, so say I am sitting in front of a window and it's a sunny day outside, I will be silhouetted because if the camera is on the inside of the house, obviously, the person is in the hence they are darker. So um, you always want to keep that in mind. Same thing goes with if there's a lamp behind somebody, it's all if you're interviewing somebody on camera, the, the light source in front of them, whether it's the camera in front of them or your stand or the video person is standing where the light source is coming in from. It's also called the key light. The, key, the light should be on the face of the subject. Uh, otherwise, it'll be dark and it'll look um, like if you're doing an America's Most Wanted piece. Um, the second thing is to think about is you want to um, be able to hear whoever it is that's talking. If you aren't able to hear them, I don't care how much research you've done, I don't care how much um, shooting you've done, beautiful video you have, if you can't hear them, your message goes out the door. So you want to make sure that if you do have a microphone, use the mic. Uh, if you don't have a mic, then make sure that uh, you are aware of the environment. So if you're shooting outside and there's construction happening, you might well not want to shoot outside because the construction sound will overpower the people and so with the traffic if they're really close to you know, busy street. And if you're indoors, you will be aware and cognizant of the uh, air conditioning units or any sort of refrigerator that might have buzz because you can't edit that out. Okay, so um, that is very important. Another thing you want to think about is when you want to let this verbal project <laughs> You definitely do not want the video to be so shaky that it gives you a headache. So if you can, use your tripod or use a tripod. And if you don't have a tripod, you know, try to borrow one from somebody and test it out. Um, then I would say use the world as your tripod. I always tell students that if you can uh, lean up against the wall and cradle the camera in both hands uh, or chest, uh, that might be a good idea. Or if you could put it on a chair or a table or somewhere that is steady. Steady video always looks way, 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 way more professional than video shot just off of the tripod in your hand. And it's essential to keeping people engaged because it, when you watch a very shaky video, you get um, a headache and hence you want to turn, um, you want to turn the channel or change the channel the video. Uh, you also, when you're shooting, want to hold the shot for at least 15 to 20 seconds, which means that if your camera is on a tripod, you hit the record button and you leave it alone, don't touch it for 15 to 20 seconds, so that the editor 
can um, make sure that there are edit points, which means that there's you know there's enough video for you to use. Um, if I'm shooting the, a video, for example, of Billy walking down the street, and I introduce Billy walking down the you know her, the streets of New York where she grew up, this bad neighborhood, and I want to make sure that the video is at least long enough for me to use that when it matches up with the, the voiceover. And uh, another thing you want to think about is when you're um, when you're shooting, three main things is it, you have a variety of shots you need. You need three shots. You need a wide shot, which is your establishing shot. So if you're shooting a city, um, you know, skyline of San Francisco, for example, it, a wide shot is a shot of you know the skyline. Uh, if you're shooting a person, me teaching in front of a, a classroom, then you want from me to head to toe, from head to toe. The second shot you'll need is a medium shot, which is if like you're shooting San Francisco, it's just a cluster of buildings and not the whole city skyline. And if I'm in, uh, you're shooting me or videotaping me or in front of a blackboard, it would just be from my waist to my head is a medium shot. And medium shots give you uh, effective on where the person is or what they be in relation to other things. Last but not least, what's really important is you have to get close-up shots because close-up shots, uh, you know, so if your volunteer is talking about, uh, you know, something that has happened to them that inspired them to action, something maybe tragic or, um, you know, heartfelt, then you want to get these close-up shots of their face so that you can see the tears dripping down their cheeks. Uh, so that you can see the emotion in their eyes. Um, and they also help, for those of you that are editors out there, if you get a lot of close-up shots, they help with what's called jump cuts. So when you have two pieces of video that look jumpy next to each other, it really helps kind of um, transition. It transitions the piece. Um, whatever your... Sherry and Swan, it's so great to hear your presentation, Swan, um, as always. And uh, we share a lot of like. Um, and as I get started, I'm just curious to see if uh, people are beginning to see my screen and uh, my slides. Yeah, we can see your screen perfectly. Thanks. OK, perfect. So why don't I get started? I think, you know, as I tell my story, and I know many of you have, um, you know, part of Part of the curiosity, the untapped power of volunteer stories and, and the topic today is also to really think broadly about what volunteer means. It's not just the board member, et cetera. So as I share this story, you know, think about who all your stakeholders are and uh, importantly also, um, you know, why for you, just as uh, Tuan talked about, why is your story important? Um, so there's a story of a lovely lady. How many people remember the Brady Bunch? And unfortunately, we're doing this as a webinar. So go ahead and chat away if you do remember. Um, you know, I grew up with TV. And as Swan talked about, media influential of what TV, uh, of, of what your image is and what your perception and what your story should be. Um, well, here's the Wong Bunch, uh, you know, the perfect family portrait of mom sitting on my dad's lap. But you know, our problems were not solved uh, in 30 minutes, like the Brady Bunch. Um, 
you know, the projects where I grew up was not the house in the suburbs, and my dad did not come home, uh, if at all, to kiss my mom on the cheek. So I think, you know, when we look at TV and the perception of what, um, you know, stories are supposed to look like, that is something that really matters. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it's really my mom's story that's so inspirational. She's an immigrant from China. She raised my brother and myself as a single mom. And, you know, I remember her working the sweatshop, uh, putting her, herself through night school at FIT, at Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. And she ultimately was an entrepreneur. She was able to um, open her own fa factory in the garment district uh, and made us enough money to move us out of the projects. Um, and, you know, to this day, she doesn't believe her story matters. Um, you know, as Gandhi has always quoted, be the change you wish to see in the world. What if you're like my mom and you don't see yourself and you don't see your own story? And, um, you know, how can you even begin to make that change? So even as a nonprofit professional, I think it's really important for you to dig deep and think about, you know, what is your story? What is your organization's story? Um, and as you reach out to your volunteers and you sharing your story just like I do um, and Swan does, I hope it also motivates people um, you know, to, to be involved. Um, the power of perception. You know, my perception of making it was to be a banker on Wall Street. The World, the, the World Trade Center framed my kitchen window. Um, but before September 11, somebody also saw the same picture and their perception um, you know, was that it would create chaos. Um, it was going to be something that would uh, create uh, a negative uh, perception in the world. We both acted on the perception. Somehow I made it to Wall Street. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, the other parties saw a plane going through it. And that, that is the power of story. Story can change the world. And, I, and this is the same thing we say to our kids. Um, at Baycat, and um, you know that's partly why, given that power, why I started Baycat. Inspired by my mom's story and, and the fact that we really believe story matters, we want to empower youth and transfer communities one story at a time. Um, and in the next couple of minutes, I'll tell you how we've done that. So even though it's me talking, it's really taken thousands of people, volunteers, to help make that come together. Um, BAYCAT stands for Baby Hunters Point Center for Arts and Tech. We, the ACME teaches uh, through free programs historically underserved youth from 11 to uh, 25 in filmmaking and marketing and media. Um, BAYCAT Studio is a professional studio that also hires our graduates, but um, many of our clients are other nonprofit agencies, corporations, our donors, um, foundations. And the whole idea is that we can create powerful stories, turn them into either advertising, promotional videos, whatever that is. Um, and as you see in this image, they can be part of billboard campaigns. Um, last week, we have Big Hat Productions. And in this slide, you get a sense of, a set, uh, of how many people we serve in a year. So it's everything from over 2,500 students at this point. We've, we've taught teachers. Our kids create a TV show. Um, Big Studio has had over 100 clients um, and over 250 projects. We also give back a great deal. Um, and um, we've actually been able to hire over uh, 50 of our graduates. And then Big Cat Productions um, has been in many, many film festivals, so uh, with the international reach. So this is a power story, and Big Cat is a structure in which to be able to release these stories. So I, as I mentioned, Baycat Academy uh, educates in these particular fields. Part of it is we want the, the tools of filmmaking and video production, as Tuan has said, it's gotten a lot easier to, to create these videos. Well, why not have these messages be created by the youth, for the youth, by the community, for the community? So they're learning all those things. Um, but together with the profound in hand, our board chairs from Pixar in the middle of not the um, Rod you know, Roger or, or the Tom Hanks character, but Pearson is our board chair. And his, uh, he's a volunteer, but he, when he came to Baycat, he immediately saw why that mentorship is so important. And he wished there was a place like Baycat when he was growing up. 
Um, so our young people have been invited to Pixar's and, and have been um, mentored by many, many um, productions, folks, video folks, um, just people in industry to talk about their story and why uh, the path matters. Um, perception, you know, so mainly from the South Squadron of San Francisco, and when I say Bayview, uh, you might think about the crime rate. Um, but instead, I want you to think about Tiffany. Tiffany Jones has been there. She started since she was 11. Um, she's an amazing animator. And imagine that her story is so powerful that she's had the chance to get in front of the Yahoo corporate audience wide. It's lasted longer than Carol Marks, the prior CEO. Um, so it is changing the perception. So instead of feeling sorry for kids growing up, they view Tiffany, hire her. Um, she's so capable. Um, we've hired her to actually help um, do the facade improvement of a local um, merchant store. Um, so how many artists out there get that patronizing, you know, uh, it's great, you want to be an artist. We know in the Bay Area all these young people can be employed. Studio is a model of employing our young people. Again, story matters. Uh, so between a teenager designing the logo because it's her neighborhood, her community center, and she saw it as being symbolized by a tree being planted. Um, that AGOC logo is on a building. Um, Benjamin and Peter Bratt, beautiful Benjamin Bratt story is very important. As we know, um, he's, he's seen in Hollywood, he tells many different stories, but he's a Bay Area resident. Um, they created the story La Mission, and Bay Cat Studio was employed to actually create the making of uh, and to do the behind the scenes of that story. Um, this is a little video clip of these, I don't know if you're able to see this, um, but basically these are stories of young people that were part of a focus group through Dr. Joe Marshall's program of the Omega Boys Club. And you know, imagine Brandon, the basketball player who was a victim of violence, uh, and here he is on a billboard. That's how powerful story is. Um, Last but not least, when you look at the last division of, of Baycat, Baycat Productions, we also believe that, uh, you know, yes, there's a call to action, but sometimes you just got to entertain and motivate people. Um, Julio that's pictured there on the left with his family is a teenager here in a high school um, in San Francisco. He wrote a short story. Um, we took the short story as part of um, also the 826 Dave Eggers uh, 826 Valencia project. We turned that story into a screen, screenplay and then turned it into a movie. And this is our 18 to 25 year old peers working with teenagers uh, to turn this into a movie. The movie ended up being called Miles Away. It starred one of our young, uh, young video videographers, actually, who uh, also decided to do a little acting. Um, and it ended up in five film festivals. Uh, the festival circuit is something that we're just beginning to investigate. Each one of these titles uh, are, represent different stories that we've told, whether it's uh, Latina moms talking about their kids coming out to a young dancer, um, you know, staying off but learning to dance. Um, so when it comes to thinking about your volunteers, it's not just who we serve, like the Nick Casadas of the world. He's a young man who started when he was 11. It's also the story of the impact of the parents that are standing next to him. Um, he went to SOTA, is now um, finishing up his year, junior year at Columbia College as a film student. Jose and his impact, uh, he was an intern at Baycat, um, and then we, he, he never went away, volunteered with us, but then we hired him full-time onto the Baycat, and he's been our production manager and on the full-time team for two years. So just think about the impact of his story to the next generation. So going back to the Brady Bunch, here's the story of a lovely lady. It's actually turned into, here's the many, many stories of so many people through Baycat. Um, and each one of these little boxes represents you know, the thousand people behind the scenes uh, of whose stories matter. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, why it's uh, so important to us and where it came from for me personally but also how we've created a nonprofit structure um, through the academy to teach people how to actually tell those untold stories. Um, 
through Big Hat Studio, where if this is not your forte, like Tuan was talking about, we would be happy to help you, um, you know, create those videos. Um, Big Hat Productions, which is that question of when you have this beautiful content, where is it that you could show it off? Um, and and there's so many uh, there's so many things to still be discovered. Um, we're going to be 10 years old next year, which is amazing as a founder to see that happen. Um, and I got to um, enjoy, enjoy Tuan's wonderful uh, reporting. Um, you know, proud last year when our student laptops were stolen in week five of our program uh, overnight, and we were you know for the first time all of a sudden in the press. Why? Because of bad news, not because of good news. But we, we turned that on its ear and created a Indiegogo campaign to raise 50,000 in 50 days. So, you know, those hard stories are ones to tell, but again, I think, you know, changing the perception for us is very important. We want people not just to react to the negativity, but to really feel empowered. Um, as Tuan does in his um, Gig Spark program, um, to, to really um, create positive action. Um, so last but not least, before I know we, we want to open up to questions, is um, I, can you see on my screen the, um, the PDF, and we'll um, attach this uh, to, the, um, to the slides in, in, at the end. Um, this is a Big Cat call for proposal. We're all looking for great stories and nonprofits and corporations to work with. Um, this FP is an example, and it gives you the breadth of video services that we offer. Um, it shows examples of our work, um, and we've done everything from leadership San Francisco to music videos to promotional videos to award videos. Um, you might see a couple of nonprofits there. Jumpstart the Institute at the Golden Gate Leadership San Francisco highlighted there. Um, some of the things that Juan talked about are, are, are processes that we could walk through with you from pre-production, production to post to completion. I think the biggest tips I can give to um, nonprofit professionals is that it, um, making a video, video can be very easy. It could cost $5,000 $5, or it could cost $5,000 or it could cost $50,000. That's a million. Um, so the breadth that you know, quality, all those things are factors, and how to us you create the video is even more important. I think that's what makes us stand out, which is fellow nonprofit, and we're in the same piece that you are, and we understand how difficult to allocate budgets, time, energy to make these videos. So that's why we are here to help you. The last page shows these um, questions, and just as Tuan framed how you should think about story. If, if you want to work with any videographer, this is not your strength, these are the basic questions you should always think about answering. So, you know, what, what is the project? What type of video are you interested in? What story do you want to tell? And here are some examples. You know, who is your audience is super important. And how do you plan to dis distribute the video? I know folks were asking about viral videos. It's not that you create a video that's viral. It is the process that makes it, the process of distribution that makes it viral. And it's not just about putting it on YouTube or on the internet. It is about, you know, really reaching out to the network of people that you have existing and thinking about how do they influence the next, you know, um, ring of people that you need to get involved with. Um, the purpose, very, very important. Often. Um, many people try to jam many purposes into one video, and often that dilutes um, the power and the effectiveness of it. So that's something to think about. Um, and then last but not least, of course, the theme, the message, what do you want people to remember, what is the call to action, and then your budget. Um, we've worked hand-in-hand -hand with nonprofits that had a great vision, and sometimes it's taken five years to incubate a very big idea. So we're here to be a resource for you beyond this, this webinar call. Thank you for the opportunity again for, to, for us to share our story. And we'd be happy to um, continue, uh, uh, you know, talking about the power of storytelling with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lily. The um, breadth and impact of the work that Baycat is doing is just so wonderful, um, and it was really great to hear about that. So um, now um, we have a few minutes for some questions uh, for Tuan and Zilli. Um, I'm actually going to 
kick things off. Um, and let me know if you can see my screen, actually. Can, can people see my screen? Um, okay, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. We don't need my screen for the questions. So um, the first question that I have for Twan and Billy is related to um, a bunch of questions that people in the audience have been asking, which is, um, how do you engage your volunteer? Let's say you want to tell your volunteer stories. Some, a lot of organizations have expressed that they have trouble, you know, getting responses or finding the finding the right volunteers that have, or you know, getting access to these stories of volunteers. What are some tips for um, getting your volunteers excited to tell their stories? And this could be for either of you. Um, I'll, I'll take a I'll take a crack at that or this one. Yeah. Um, so so I know for us, you know, we have um, we have three open house events a year that are live, um, and I do feel like the power of telling a story when they hear a story and they hear it from a peer. So whether it's a parent telling their story, a kid telling their story, a funder, a donor, a volunteer, there's definitely a very positive ripple effect. Um, so most people are shy to tell their story. Um, you know, often it takes that one-on-one -on -one visit and opening up. Um, and it's also that, you know, what forum is that story going to be told? Um, if it's at the open house, you know, often people come to that and when they see the power of, you know, their story and that kind of setting, um, you know, of course it's got to be the right fit. Uh, most people open up if you ask them and if you give them time to prepare and focus. To back off of what Billy was saying, I totally agree. Anytime you can involve your volunteer, potential volunteers um, in the process, get them excited. We recently did a 50-50 in, um, Indiegogo campaign. And for those of you guys that may not be familiar with Indiegogo, it's like Kickstarter. It's a crowdfunding campaign whereby you create a video and upload content about what it is you're trying to raise money for. And our recent campaign was called 50-50 because we want to get a kickstart in uncovering an everyday hero in each state, in 50 states across America. And one interesting thing I want to say also, aside from the, you know, events are good, um, and also I would say get creative with the event or in the way you um, dig for those stories. So for example, uh, we did a, and you can totally use this idea too, uh, we did a um, go inspire, go photo social media walk. And what does that entail? Um, well, essentially, we uploaded, um, it was just a post, we've done it at dot com. Um, and essentially, we, uh, on a Sunday that we chose, at 1 o'clock, we met people in the Mission area here. It's um, an area here. It's like a really cool urban neighborhood uh, here in Go. And we just met with the community, and our team members were there. And we walked around. Um, we mapped out a certain area. Where, where people could walk by really cool mural, murals and stores and bottle shops and things like that. And all we asked people to do was talk to each other, get to know each other, take photos, buy you upload it with a hashtag of, you know, and follow go and fire go. And through that, I mean, we got uh, this one man met me by the name of Michael Fulham. We repeatedly donated to our 50-50 campaign because he emailed me afterwards and he said, wow, you know, Thank you. You're such a natural cheerleader for this cause, and I really believe that there needs to be more good news out there. Um, the energy around your I was about to be around people. The energy was infectious. I just want to let you know that again, I was struck by death recently. My mom recently passed away, and this was really hard, harder than because of my mom. And on days that I feel like I just have no hope, I watch you go inspire those stories, and they give me hope to continue throughout the day. And so uh, Michael repeatedly donated. Uh, you can also have hikes and get people together to hike or like Billy special. So cool studio, you guys definitely visit our studio when you guys come out here. It's the dream studio, it's amazing. Um, and you can invite people to these. Um, also, if you're going to do it uh, socially, through social media, like I pointed out earlier in my slide, Make it fun and creative. Is there something, oh, maybe someone, some of your board members might have tickets 
to a theme park, see a pair of them, or if you know somebody in your like next class drive, I don't know, so something creative that you can also make it kind of competitive and fun and know that what for them, and that's another creative way that you can also um, volunteer, get them excited about helping their story. Great, thank you. Those are some really great tips. Um, another question that's come up a lot um, is uh, most of, of or the organizations on the call don't have video expertise, even storytelling expertise. So it, it assumes that we're all total novices, total beginners. What are some tips, novice tips and of equipment and strategy and timeline that you might have? And especially if you could speak to um, soft programs, what the what are the best beginner programs for video production and editing um, that you two would recommend? Would you like me to take a look at that? Go go for it, Tom. Go 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 for it. Um, you know, I was going to say, you know, uh, the, the tech has improved so much that, you know, people can do uh, basic um, video on the iPhone and, and use IC. Um, you know, there are many, many apps that um, you could actually edit a video online. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, before you actually shine whatever camera it, it is you're using, really think about the story. Um, and the tips that we give it, who are you going to shoot, why are you going to tell it, who is going to do the storytelling, um, that is really the most important part. Um, at the end of the day, if you end up using something very simple, like an eye, and use that as an experiment, um, I would go through that process of storytelling, film it, see if you could edit it, even at a risk level, um, and show it to uh, you know your target audience or a focus group and see what kind of reaction you get. You can always you know, invest more and get higher quality equipment and, and camera and camera work um, and software. But you know honestly, I think um, practicing, as Juan says, it's the, the art of the storytelling, even with the full equipment that you feel comfortable with, would be good. I would start as a beginner. That's, that's um, a great foundation. So I always think of creating videos like building house. First, you need the foundation, which means that you need to do your research, like we talked about earlier, and you need to research your um, your team and that you have, and see that if there's anybody there, um, right reason there that can help you. Why reason you create the wheel if you don't have to and have extra things when if you have something that can help you shoot and edit and can walk you through it, that's in your network. Do that for sure. Um, and um, it depends on the story you want to tell and your budget. Sure, you know, um, on the lower end, iPhones take incredible video that's HD now, and you can download a quick, some quick software, iMovie, like Billy said, to do that. Um, otherwise, if you do have like a MacBook Pro that's able to process um, big chunks of video, and you want to get a little more professional, you can get Final Cut. That's the newest Final Cut Pro. Um, and you can buy that for a few hundred bucks at the Apple store. And, um, you know, you can plug that in and just start practicing, like Billy said. Uh, but I would, you know, first begin, I wouldn't run before I um, could crawl and then walk. So what I would do is definitely do your research, find out who can help you in, in your team or if they have family friends that would be excited to help, and then figure out what you want to do. Then you can figure out the budget behind it and the equipment that you may need, because it could be as simple as, something you just upload, uh, shoot on your your cell phone, and then you know, edit, it, edit it on your cell phone itself, and then straight to YouTube. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, and technically we are finished. So um, thank you both so much. Before we end, I want to make a quick plug for next month's session. Um, Next month, we're going to be joined by the Cates Foundation to talk about their Be Fearless campaign and how that relates to volunteer engagement. Uh, so um, stay tuned for that. Um, it's not the registration isn't up yet, but if you, if you um, look at on the Learning Center at learnvolunteermatch.org to see when that goes up. Again, huge thank you to Twan and Billy for sharing their stories and the expertise around storytelling. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope you all did.
thanks to all of you for joining us for this Moffitt Insights session today. Again, we will be sending out into the webinar recording slides and other sort of mentions in the session, so no worries there. And I really hope um, that you all will join for a future nonprofit insight session. On behalf of Volunteer Match, thanks so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hello.